Welcome to Black Hollywood Live Conversations. We're going to be talking about, we're going to be talking to somebody who knows who killed Tupac. Coming up. You are tuned in to Black Hollywood Live Conversations. Ooh, I need a little bit higher though. There you go. Welcome guys, my name is TK Trinidad, Black Hollywood Conversations. We're going to get into it. She's a screenwriter, producer, a New York Times bestseller, author, and the leading source on the upcoming a &E documentary, Who Killed Tupac? Please welcome Lolita Files. Welcome, welcome. So let's just get into it. Who killed Tupac? That's <laughs> not that easy. <laughs> do you, do you, is, is there uh, somebody, because we've been talking about this for years. A long time. Right. 21 years. So do you have like a name in particular that you sure. Are you gonna? Well, you know, the point of the docu series is to get to that. But you know, we did a really deep dive. Okay. I see. I've seen a couple of your. I've seen a lot of your interviews, and I know you haven't given anybody else the answer. So I figured I'd just hit it off the top. <laughs> and shoot I your get best you, shot. Yeah. Just, shoot your shot. Yeah. Wednesday. But, but you. But you're on top of it. So let's go. We'll, we'll get back into all that stuff, but. I am kind of want to get you started, um, get started on how you got into writing. So I was reading that you talked about one of your goals being published at 30, and that yes. didn't happen. But it, uh, it didn't happen, but I got my agent, like, very soon after that. So and what, I kind of want to know what happened, like, did you hit 30 and you're like, I wanted to do this and it didn't happen? No, it wasn't even that. It was that I'd set the goal, and uh, I just had a corporate career, I worked for the Kendrick Care Corporation. And um, it required me to travel a lot. I kind of had national jurisdiction mm -hmm. for my division. And, um, as, you know, still was writing some, doing some writing at home whenever I could or wherever I was, always on my laptop. And I'm like, okay, 30 pass. I wasn't paying attention. I was slipping. Right. Let me get, let me do this. And um, um, I looked up some agents. I figured, you know, may as well you know, shoot your shot. Right. Go for, I figured I'd start sending out my material in fours, like four at a time. And mm -hmm. as I got rejected, I'd go and do another four. Okay. I assumed I'd get rejected. Right. And um, I picked like four of the top agents in the country, um, three of which were based out of New York. Mm -hmm. And I, and at the time, John Grisham had like three books in the top 10. He had The Firm, he had A Time to Kill, and mm -hmm. he had Pelican Brief. And I'm like, and knowing nothing about agents, I'm like, whoever his agent is, is hooking him up. <laughs> May as well shoot my shot for his agent. Right. And so I send out these um, two short stories and then an excerpt of a book that I was writing called Child of God. I sent it to Grisham's agent and the other three agents. And I sent it in these overnight packages, mm -hmm. Airborne Express, and they were this bright yellow, these prepaid packages. Sent it and was like, okay. And all the books that I'd read about agents said it took them six to eight weeks to get back to you. Right. So I figured I had time. And my intent was to, in the cover letter I told them I wrote, I had eight short stories, excuse me, that I had 10 short stories. Mm -hmm. I only had two written. And so I figured in those six to eight weeks, I'd write the other eight. Right. Next day I'm at work um, at the corporate office. Uh, and I'm on the phone with a friend who had been nudging me to do this. And uh, back then I had a sky pager my sky pager, remember those? No, what is it? Wow, you know, okay, so sky pagers were pagers, um, and uh, like kind of high end if you like, you know, like I like I had the entire, my, my entire employees in the field would right. call my sky pager, and it would show up as an 800 number where they would leave me a message, and I could retrieve the message. Okay. So my, my sky pager goes off, and I was kind of annoyed. I'm like, why didn't anybody check the office first? Why are they calling my sky pager? Right. And, um, then my assistant starts knocking on my door. I was in the office on the phone. And I'm like, I'm on the phone. So she slides a note under the desk. So as I'm retrieving the voicemail from the pager, it's Grisham's office. Hi, we just got your short stories. They're so amazing. The characters are so incredible. They're just spectac. And at the word spectac, I was so freaked out, I threw the phone down. <laughs> And my uh, assistant's knocking on the door. And I'm like, go away. And she slides a note under the door uh -huh. for me to call Grisham's agency. They said call ASAP. And now I'm super freaked out. Wow. And so the person I'm on the phone with is like, what's going on? And I said, Grisham's agency called me about, you know, I wasn't speaking in any, any kind of coherent shock. Way. The people called me about the thing. <laughs> what people, what thing? And at that, and then I decided, let me check my voicemail at home just to see. And they had called there. Mm -hmm. So I called them. And at the time, they had this guy working at the front desk who was a pit bull. 
and his intent was just block anybody from calling right. him. He was just BSing. And I, you know, he answers the phone, get him, Brooke. And I'm like, hi, this is Lolita Files. I, oh, hi, Lolita, hold on, we've been waiting for you. Oh, my goodness. So, you know, you get on the phone, we love these short stories, could you send us the other eight? And I said, and they said, we have them by uh, Monday. Right. It was Friday. I said, is Tuesday okay? They said, Tuesday's great. And congratulations, no one ever gets through to us. So I jumped in my car. I left the office, jumped in my car. If you know anything about Montgomery, Alabama, which is where I was living at the time, it's kind of like Atlanta in that it has like 285, the loop. Okay. <laughs> I did like 20 loops around the city, got a case of Pepsi, went home, put on every Prince song I had, huge Prince fan, wrote nonstop from Friday 6 p.m. to Sunday 1 p.m., no sleep. So and wrote those eight short stories. Did you have the the stories kind of like in the back nope. of your? You just pulled them. I've out. used the two shorts, the two stories, the two short, the two excerpts that I already written. I wove it into a novel, and um, it was the same characters. Mm -hmm. And I just kind of chronologically wrote the other eight, and then it turned into a novel, which I never published. Right. I'm actually going to publish it this year because it's a prequel to a trilogy of books that I did publish. Okay. Wow. Long story short. No, but I mean, that it's still, because you have so many people talk about it. It's mm -hmm. like, oh, well, I need to get this and this and that. That's why I found that tidbit so interesting, because yeah. you have people have all these goals, but, you know, well, I could have been this, and I could have done that. And it's always, like, interesting, well, how did you get to that? What kind of pushed you out of the could have, or I wanted to, or yeah, I will I just, do? You know, again, I had a friend kind of nudging me, and then I put it out there. And the second I put it, it was like... It's like that aspect of my life was waiting for me right. to make a move. Okay. Now, you did say some of your um, kind of idols as far as writers were Toni Morrison, Richard Wright, people like that. So how did they influence you, or is there any book in particular that kind of set you off on this, you know, writing path? By them. Um, my favorite writer is Shakespeare, then Toni Morrison, Richard Wright. Uh, Shakespeare's works really set me off. Toni Morrison, when I read Song of Solomon, it was just that book was just so extraordinary to me, the way it played with magical realism, mm -hmm. all of that. It played with reality, and then, but it was deeply entrenched in um, um, that era and the people and our culture, you know. And so that book really moved me. Like, I can write these kind of stories. Right. Hopefully aspire to the level that Tony writes at, but Shh. write these kinds of stories, and there's an audience for them. Tony Morrison, I feel like you have to write, you have to read her books a couple of times. You do. Like, I remember reading it, so my dad had this huge bookcase of, like, a lot of different authors, black authors. I remember reading it as a kid, and I'm like, oh, like, I got through the book, but if you ask me what happened, what happened it's like... Somebody flew. Yeah, something happened. Somebody didn't have a yeah, table. It's kind of like one of those things. And then you read it again and again. It's like there's always kind of like it's like almost like peeling the orange. It's like, oh, because as you're experiencing your life, now you can kind of relate to those things. There's a point of things. reference. So it's just she's definitely the top. Now, um, kind of let's get, well, what's your what's your favorite? So you have, what's your favorite book that you've written? Do you have like a, a special baby um, out of all of them? Well, Child of God, uh, I kind of consider my magnum opus, if you will. Um, that book um, took me 10 years off and on to write. Most of my books I wrote fairly quickly. My mm -hmm. first book that was published seems from a sister. I wrote it in a week when I was in the blush of new love. But I was working on Child of God, and it written a scene in Child of God that freaked me out. And uh -huh. it was so dark, I'm like, you know, there's something wrong with me. I need to close that book and write something funny to close right. my palette. And I ended up writing the scenes. Most of my books I wrote, again, very quickly. That one was an homage, like this tip of the hat I wanted to do to Shakespeare, mm -hmm. Toni Morrison. Um, um, I love the Russian writers, mm -hmm. you know, and Greek mythology. And so it's this, and, and Zora Neale Hurston. So it's this distillation of the impact of all of those books on me. And my thought with it was, you know, if the page from this book gets stuck to the bottom of Toni Morrison's shoe, I will have succeeded. And unbeknownst to me, um, not long after it came out, some booksellers in Atlanta who were friends of mine were friends of Tony's and sent her the book with a post-it note that says, you have to read this now. Now, Tony called my friend back, you know, <gasps> Fanta, very, fairly quickly. Uh -huh. And Fanta told my best friend, who's an author, mm -hmm. told another very close friend of mine, Eric Jerome Dickey, who's an author, told, her what, told them what Tony Morrison said. I didn't find out until two years later when I was on book tour for All my right. book, Tastes Like Chicken, and the booksellers threw a party for me because they were so proud of Child of God, mm -hmm. which I didn't get to tour because 9-11 happened. And um, they're like, we're so proud of you for this book. And oh, and when Tony read it, and I said, when Tony read it, and 
Apparently, when she read the book, she uh -huh. called Fanta and said to Fanta, I can die now. There's someone to whom I can pass the torch. <gasps> so I almost passed out when I found out. She why did said, they wait so long to... I'm a, I, I was asking my, my best friend, why did you tell me? She said, I thought you knew. I thought Fanta told you. They oh all thought goodness. I'd been told. Wow. So that book, I kind of say, I jokingly say, it used me to get here because it's bigger than me. I can... If somebody sees my name, if they've read that book, they, mm -hmm. you know, I'd get like... FedEx packages or go to the um, um, the mail courier or whatever will see my name and go, did you write Child of God? I'm like, I can't. Wow. So it's bigger than me in that regard. Okay, okay. So kind of let's uh, get into one of the reasons why you're here. This whole Tupac thing. So we'll start with the book. Mm -hmm. So Once Upon a Time in Compton. Uh, that came out in April. Yes. So how is... How has the success of the book been? Have people received it? Have people reached out to you and... Both. People have reached out to me, you know, I haven't gotten any negative feedback, me or the writers, you know, people have um, um, been, ex you know, it's a pretty big book. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, you always worry if it will feel like a slow pages. read to people. People loved it. Yeah. And they like, they plowed through it, you know, not plowed through it. They went through it very quickly mm -hmm. um, and were excited to learn about that world. And, um, um, see the credibility in it because the interesting thing, you know, thing about Tim and Bobby, the two cops, Tim Brennan and Robert Ladd, is that they're pretty bare naked mm -hmm. when they talk about their experience. They're not trying to gloss themselves over. They show the grit that went with the job right. and, you know, what they were up against, the community, the relationships, all of that. And um, um, that's what pulled me into the story, their relationship with the community. And that's the thing, too, especially in this climate that we're in, what I noticed is just kind of like, how transparent they were. Mm -hmm. And I kind of feel like if that were the case with a lot of other issues, then we might be still upset, but we can still be empathetic on the other side. Right, we could have a conversation. Right. The conversation is not happening. Yeah. So, and that should be happening. Oh, that's a whole nother <laughs> rabbit, rabbit hole of stuff. Um, my question to you, because I, for you guys who don't know, I'm like really excited to ask this question. Um, and I want to ask it off air, but I'm going to save it. Did you see All Eyes on Me? I did. What did you think? Uh, I actually, um, uh, uh, full disclosure, I was kind of um, sort of connected to All Eyes on Me. Mm -hmm. I, um, um, I know the lead pretty okay. well. I just love him to pieces, Demetrius Ship Jr., um, who I thought did a phenomenal job. I thought he became Pac. Right. You, you, you start watching it and you're like, you know, um, I was like, okay, here we go. Um, Got to have to really suspend disbelief. That's what I went in thinking, right? Because I'm a, I'm a cinephile. I'm hardcore and really, you know. And at some point, I just believed he became Pac to me. My full disclosure part is I was actually involved in some of the marketing for the um, for the film. Mm -hmm. um, there was an HBO first look that was done on it. I was set producer for that. Okay. So we had a lot of connection too. Did you write it? No, I did not write the book. Okay. <laughs> I would have said that up front, but so it was. It was more of a loose connection, but it, I was connected to Mark. That Condit. that was my thing. I the acting was great. Mm -hmm. um, there were certain things that I didn't know because when it happened, it, it's just you know. Here's an, another example. It's just for instance, like the OJ trial. Mm -hmm. Like when that happened, like I was like a kid, and mm -hmm. all I knew was like, oh, okay, great. He's. But I had no idea the backstory. Yeah. So you know, you see all these little things that you saw, but it's just kind of like it, it, the. Compared to, you know, Straight Out Compton, it wasn't... Right. Straight Out Compton is a different animal. Yeah. yeah. And it's just kind of like, man, it was just missing mm -hmm. something. So I was trying to get your take on it. It's interesting because people are one way or the other about it. There's no gray. I have not met a soul who has been gray about the movie. Right. Black or white about it. Yeah, it was... Because I feel people are kind of gray with, with the Biggie Smalls one. Yeah. It's kind of like, oh, okay, we get it. But with the Tupac one, it's like, mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm trying, I'm trying. So I kind of wanted to get your opinion on the movie. which mm -hmm. And I think it was it came out after the book, too. It which, did. Which is kind of a nice little uh, segue. Yeah. Now, with that, who did you interview? Um, did you interview separate people for the book and separate people for the Annie docuseries? Yeah, but for the Annie docuseries, we interviewed a whole lot of people. You know, um, um, people that, um, unless you were a part of Pac's life or deep in his world, you had no idea, mm -hmm. you know, who these people were in some instances, but people that were very known in their world, mm -hmm. um, in the movement, uh, in hip hop, all aspects of it. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people that you don't hear about a lot who really had a lot of information. So now, because of the movie, uh, 
Jada came out and had some stuff to say. Now, did you get to interview her for the docuseries and was she able to say, you know, her piece? I know she did an open letter and I know she did a mm -hmm. couple of interviews and stuff like that, but I don't know what the timing of the docuseries was. Yeah, we didn't interview Jada for the series, okay. um, but she's pretty much made her feelings known. You know, you, there's no guesswork when it comes to her and she's very protective of her relationship with Pac. That was her response regarding All Eyes on Me. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, like there was some um, literary license that was taken with the movie and she's super protective of her relationship right. with him and she felt it didn't reflect. Yeah, you know, it was kind of a, it, yeah, it felt like it was telling another story mm -hmm. versus mm -hmm. what she's been saying for years. Mm -hmm. and, and But I, what I liked about what she did is that she separated um, the two stars, mm -hmm. you know, who played Pac and um, uh, her from what was written. Like, right. you guys did a great job. You were just doing your job. Mm -hmm. But this is not accurate and that's in a, terms of her experience. A writing, a writing thing. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> you, can see, you can see what side of the fence I, I, mm -hmm. I fell on. Um, so as far as all the interviews that you did um, on both fronts, is there any one of them or is there any few that um, you remember, or not remember, that you're like, man, I didn't know all this stuff? Do you get to inv interview Tupac's mother before she passed away? No, she passed away before we started shooting the show. Oh. Yeah, I know. She passed away in April. Yeah, last two thousand. Yeah, it's yeah. crazy. Oh, so, what about for the book? Did I get? I didn't get a chance to interview her for the book, but it really wasn't necessary for the book mm -hmm. because the book basically was chronicling Tim and Bobby's experience. Okay. Um, uh, being involved in the Tupac murder case and what they were doing from Compton, because when he was shot in Vegas, all the players involved came back to Compton. They were from Compton, and mm -hmm. a war broke out there. And so, even though it was a Las Vegas case, because Las Vegas was responsible for investigating the murder, right? all the players were in Compton, yeah, so right. they were the liaison between um, um, Compton and Las Vegas. So, anybody that you remember, or not anybody that... Every single person that uh, we interviewed for the show um, blew me away in some regard, because they all had some element of Pac that I think, you know, again, unless you were close to him or mm -hmm. in his circle, or really um, uh, a fan to the point to where you did deep dives into his life. There were so many things you just didn't know about him. You know, they expanded upon what we knew about him. But I think, for the most part, the greater culture and people who aren't hip-hop fans, people who, um, uh, greater white culture, mm -hmm. you know, what they learned about Tupac mostly was he was this controversial rapper who was in and out of jail, and, right. you know, and, and was murdered in, you know, Vegas. Yeah. He was so much more than that. Well, it's it's interesting too how much of a role in, for instance, the Black Panthers or even the movement mm -hmm. that he took, and with I think it was like two Super Bowls ago mm -hmm. when Beyonce did it, mm -hmm. well she she did something of it and mm -hmm. people were up in arms and mm -hmm. they don't even realize you know you know you know yes but what the Black Panthers was all about. Mm -hmm. So it'd be interesting. What do you think he would be doing? Do you think he would be still rapping now, or do you think he'd be doing something more? Do you think he, like, you know, this I think he crazy? would be leading the charge along with Colin Kaepernick. I oh, think he boy. probably would have done an anthem right. to go with this aspect, this next phase of the movement. Mm -hmm. One of the things that uh, about him was, had music not um, popped off for him the way it did, he was going to go into the movement. Mm -hmm. he, he was going to be the next level of the front line of the movement. You know, um, um, I mean, his mother was a panther, you know, I mean, uh, his stepfather um, um, was a part of the new African movement, all of that. He was raised in the movement. He was right. born into it. So you can't, not like he you couldn't can escape. escape that, was in his, that was in his DNA. And so he, all the things that he did, his music, no matter what, he was always fighting for the culture. Mm -hmm. So do you think, if you were to look at music today, mm -hmm. would you say, okay, this is just the wave of the era, or have we lost our way, or would it be your frustration there? I love the things that Beyonce has been doing, like, you know, how she's become more outspoken, mm -hmm. how Jay-Z's outspoken. Even Solange with, you know, A Seat at the Table, which I absolutely love, mm -hmm. speaking on the movement, how she pulled Master P in there, and how he's speaking right. on the movement, how her mother's speaking on the movement. I think um, even though, you know, you have mumble rap and all the other stuff and so much, you know, trap and all of it, and, and, and I love all of it. Right. But in terms of messaging, 
you know, um, we're just starting, to see, we're just seeing a few people that are doing the messaging, you know, Common, people like that. Yeah, we Common's need always more. been a staple, too. He's always been steady in that regard. We need more of the messaging. I mean, Pac found a way, Tupac found a way to, to message and you could dance to it, or you could, you know, or, or or at least, you know, meditate to it, or bob your head to it, or mm -hmm. reflect to it. You know, keep your head up. You know, holler if you hear me. Songs like that. It, it it was still music that moved you, right? But it elevated your mind and taught you a responsibility, or held you accountable, or said be accountable. So, the docu series broken up to six 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 different episodes. Mm -hmm. How are the episodes? Uh, can somebody kind of view it in different orders or should they start from the beginning or what's the breakdown for each? There is, I think you need to see them in order. Mm -hmm. um, um, because, you know, there's a, it's, the lead is uh, civil rights attorney Benjamin Crump, okay. who's, you know, the, the attorney for the Trayvon Martin family, um, Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, you know, Tamir Rice. He, oh, he's all out there every day. Mm -hmm drawing attention to these cases where otherwise if no light was shown upon them. I mean, we're seeing more and more now mm -hmm. through social media, through Twitter. We have video right when things happen. People are live streaming like, look, this just happened. And he's the person who goes to that town and keeps the light on those cases. Um, so he leads our investigation. Okay. Uh, it's pretty much kind of an extension of what he's been doing uh, on the social justice front. It's like, you know, this is a young black man who was unarmed, who was mm -hmm. murdered. So is the people who are responsible for Tupac's death somebody in the community or somebody outside of the community? That's why you have to watch the doc series. Dang it. I'm going to keep trying. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep trying. So how did you get, um, how did you get involved <coughs> in the docu series? Was it because of the book and they mm -hmm. came to you? Yeah, I knew um, um, the executive producer and Benjamin Crump, who's also executive producer, and they knew I had this book coming out, mm -hmm. which made me a bit of an expert on Compton. The Compton element is a big part, um, a strong part of the murder case, mm -hmm. and that's how I got pulled in. Okay. So, <coughs> excuse me. Do you need my more water? Or are you good? Okay. I do. I still got to take it in my throat. Um. So yeah, so that's what pulled me in. And I'm a producer on the series as well. Okay, so do you kind of do the interviews and then you're kind of guys you guys are weaving it together or Um yeah, there are three investigators on the show. Okay. So there's 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 Ben Crump and then he's got a team of investigators. Mm -hmm. So it's myself, Stephanie Frederick, who's also um one of the executive producers, and she um worked the bat excuse me, the death row beat. Mm-hmm. Um, she did some exclusive interviews back in the day when Tupac was shot that other people didn't have access to. Okay. And she, you know, so she knew a lot of the players in that world. Um, and the third investigator is P. Frank Williams, who is the executive editor of The Source, very much entrenched in the hip-hop community, wrote for the L.A. Times, mm -hmm. covered Tupac quite a bit, as well as Death Row. And so we each have a strength in the show, minus Compton, and the two cops mm -hmm. who investigated the murder from Compton. So the investigations that I do with Ben, we each do investigations with him. Mm -hmm. The ones I do with him are law enforcement centric or Compton centric, centric. So that's my strength. So would it be one of those things where you're interviewing the person and they're kind of giving you the breakdown of their involvement with Tupac, whether, you know, pros or cons, mm -hmm. and then that's kind of leaving a trail as the very end, you're going to... All of it leads to trail. That's why it makes sense to watch them in order. Uh -huh. um, as we unfold, uh, you know, investigate this person, which might lead to the next person, which leads to this, right. we learn a little bit more each step of the way. So um, somebody who was very involved in the end, I think he, actually he was there when Tupac passed away, which is Suge Knight. He's mm -hmm. in jail, I think, still. He says, I think this was a report maybe a couple of days ago or a week ago, that Tupac is still alive somewhere whether it's possible or not him and Elvis in Cuba, but let's just assume <laughs> he it's not. Does the storyline kind of lead to Suge Knight in, a sort of, in any sort of way, as far as him being involved in We cover in Suge death? Knight. You mm -hmm. know, it's kind of, it's, it, you can't talk about Tupac's death uh, without talking about death row. Right. Him, you know, those were, that was the death row era for him. 
um, he was about to leave death row, or at least... which is I didn't know about that. So mm -hmm. in the movie, what I learned about the movie, um, Tupac was trying to leave, and essentially all the bills and all that stuff that you tie up artists with just didn't make sense. So he was going to do a death row death row East, mm -hmm. which is about the round time that he would have passed away. Mm -hmm. Well, he did pass away. So I'm thinking, okay, well maybe Suge is involved. Gotta watch the doc series. It's six parts. We we go deep. Um, we talk to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. We um, mine a lot of data. Uh, um, we go places. I think a lot of people really haven't gone right. or thought to go. And by looking under rocks that people didn't necessarily look under, or didn't have the manpower too, as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and really, it was just it was. The four of us, you know, the three investigators and Ben Crump, and we were just determined, like, you know, we all love Pac in our own way. Mm -hmm. And what he meant to, you know, the African-American community, to hip-hop, to the culture. Yeah. And we want justice for him. Well, it's even surprising, not surprising, but his songs are just holding true, because even Colonel Kaepernick was wearing an All Eyes on Me shirt. Mm -hmm. A couple days ago mm -hmm. and that still speaks to if you listen to holler if you hear me you know there's just songs of his he was what he was talking about then is absolutely still relevant now nothing just kind of sad that's it's very sad it just shows you know uh, that nothing's changed that that it's just as critical now it's even more critical and and and, and we see it more now it's mm -hmm. in our faces we can't escape it everything's on YouTube or everybody has a a phone, a camera phone, where they can video and live stream and look at what's happening right, right. now. And uh, it's interesting because um, uh, Ben Crump and I are, are working on other things together. Mm -hmm. um, and the conversation that we were just having the other day is, you know, it used to be with African Americans, you know, black and brown people, like, we had to have the evidence. Right. And you show us and prove that this is really happening to you. Well, now we have that and still we get no justice. Mm -hmm. We have video where you can see those things happening to us. And then the questions come up, well, what happened before the part where they yeah. started filming? Right. How do you, maybe you provoked them. And you didn't pay your child support. You didn't pay your child support. They bring up everything from your past mm -hmm. that has absolutely no bearing. To you know, happened. the cop who did whatever to you didn't know you didn't you owe child support. Right. They were just acting on whatever in that moment. Yeah, they have a Netflix series called uh, Crime Watchers. Mm -hmm. Or not a series. I think it is. Well, it's crime art. It's really, really inter interesting stuff. Where um, he, the original one, was the one who uh, recorded Eric Garner, mm -hmm. and then there's like a group of them that they go out and they just film at night, mm -hmm. cops. And you know, somebody who's getting arrested, they'll give them the evidence. Mm -hmm. And even with some of the evidence, some pi some people get out, some people don't. It really just depends on the judge and all these factors. I remember what happened to the guy. Um who filmed Eric Garner, like, didn't they take him? He went to jail. He yeah. was the president. His, they were persecuting him because he filmed it. Well, speaking of New York, mm -hmm. you have Biggie. Mm -hmm. So are there any people that you interviewed uh, for the docuseries that also tie in to the Biggie Smalls? Absolutely. So would it be the same person? <laughs> You're going to try to get at this. You're going to reverse engineer your way into answers. Uh, we talked to, we cast a wide net, uh -huh. let's put it that way. And so we talked to people um, who knew about, who knew intimately about their relationship, the mm -hmm. relationship that, the friendship that Tupac and Biggie had. You know, what, what um, rendered that friendship asunder, you mm -hmm. know, pretty much stemmed from when he was shot at Quad Studios in New York. Um, we cast a wide net. We, I mean, we took this very seriously. It makes no sense, and it made no sense that after 21 years, you know, we didn't have answers about who killed Tupac. Right. Same with Biggie. Yeah, it should be so many, both both cases on such a high level that at least there should be something. Yeah. Some type of trail, and it felt like, oh, okay, they're dead. Now, oh, well. Yeah. yeah now we're going to make them into icons, which, you know, they deserve should be, mm -hmm. but it's like, but who killed them? Like, yeah, and, and, and people's refusal to talk, that, you know, brought attention to it, like, What's the big mystery? Which makes you think, okay, is it a conspiracy? Right. What's going on here? Or a code of silence of some sort mm -hmm. or something like that. Mm -hmm. So is there anything um, doing this investigation that surprised you that kind of like, oh, like it, 
you kind of learn certain things from different folks. It's like, mm -hmm. okay, that was interesting, but something that surprised you that you still to this day is like, I had no idea, and that still is, you know, very real to me. And very it real. happens a lot during the show. Anything that you want to... You'll see it during the show. There were a lot of things She's that I learned. not giving us I'm anything. Not. And, and, and really, and I know it, you know, it's... it's it, it, it sounds, you know, very cliche to say it, you know, you gotta wait for the show. But we really did so much work and we are so excited for people to see this series because we took this so seriously. Right. We really, um, it just made no sense that, that these crimes aren't solved. And so we were doing our very best to solve them. And the conversation that keeps happening is maybe it, they wouldn't be solved by, um, Law enforcement. Maybe it would come from journalists, right? And investigators digging through that the, one. Digging through. So, do you speak to? Uh, you said you spoke to some of the major players. So, mm -hmm. was there like a Dr. Dre, Snoop, any of those folks? We talked to a lot of people. We cast a very wide yeah, net. Give me a few names so people will be <laughs> like, oh, you talk because you know what was interesting and it's probably not even a close tie-in, but I saw Def Defiant ones. I absolutely loved that miniseries. So loved much. it and so many things I didn't because mm -hmm. you know again it's a little bit before, but I listened to the music mm -hmm. and it's just like so many things I didn't know mm -hmm. and between Defiant ones, even All Eyes on Me, The Biggie Smalls, and um, Straight Outta Compton. It's putting the story, and even to um, the O.J. Simpson documentary mm -hmm. on how L.A. was at that time. Right. It kind of puts so many things in perspective for somebody who's not from here. And, you know, you're like seeing this like, oh, I have no, I had no idea that, you know, the, the slaves, after they, they were no longer slaves, they came to, to, in, to avoid persecution. It's crazy. And then you see all these stories, you know come about, you know, um, Biggie coming to L.A., you mm -hmm. know, Tupac passing away here, the whole O.J. every all that stuff, where Dr. Dre is now. Like, all that stuff are our stories that are There were puzzle pieces that gave you a bigger picture. Like, I think, I think without series like the one that we're doing and the shows that you've mentioned and um, the O.J. Made in America doc series was just so extraordinary. It immediately became like the gold standard. Right. You know, how to do a doc series. And then the Defiant Ones came along and it was right on par. It was mm -hmm. so incredible. And what it did, for, what those series did for people is, you know, we had this big puzzle with pieces missing. Mm -hmm. People needed to understand the dynamics of L.A. as a city, as a character, basically, in a story. Right. And the conditions that people of color were under in this town to create uh, that kind of tension to where you could, you know, um, you could have a jury where people of color say set him free right even in the face of evidence where it seemed as though he did it mm -hmm. um it was a rebellion and so all those fill in the blanks you know i tried to fill in the blanks with this this was four years of research for me with this book once upon a time in compton we needed to understand how compton even came about as a city its right. birth the dynamics of it the conditions that led up to the points to where that war broke out after tupac's death um our doc series we paint a picture of all the elements and the conditions that were there that made it possible for these things to come about. Okay, so for people who haven't seen any of your interviews or, you know, the kind of the lead up to the book, mm -hmm. how did the book come about? Um, in December of 2012, my former entertainment attorney told me he'd been working with these, you know, two former um, cops from Compton, and he'd been trying to get them attached with a writer so that because they wanted to write a book, and he hadn't had any success, and would I be interested in at least sitting down and talking to them and mm -hmm. hearing their story? And he's like, they're involved in the Tupac murder case. So I'm like, okay, that's enough to pique my interest to listen. Right. And then I met them and found out that they'd been involved in not just Tupac's case, but over the 20-year, their 20-year career in Compton, um, they'd been involved, you know, they knew NWA when they were selling tapes out of the trunk of their car. DJ Quick had done an underground song about one of them, mm -hmm. and that's how he got his nickname, and everyone in the city knew him by Blondie, um, Tim Brennan. They'd been involved in the LA riots, then the Tupac murder case when the war came back. One of them, um, Tim, was on the task force for the Biggie murder case. And then the craziest part, or one of the craziest parts of all, was that they were front and center in the conflict between City Hall and the police department in Compton. And as a result, the Compton Police Department was disbanded. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, where they do that at? It's not there anymore at all? No, it's gone. Um, it, was, it was absorbed into and replaced by the L.A. Sheriff's Department. And Compton hasn't had its own police department ever since. So there was a whole lot of what is this going on right. that really pulled me in. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll, I think I'll do this. I, can, I, 
I can get excited about this. This has a lot of elements that right. attract my attention. And so as I was writing up what was going to be an outline, because I saw it also to, as a TV show, as a drama series here, um, and I said, you know, take me to your Compton. Show me Compton through your eyes and do the equivalent of a ride-along. Right. It took me around, and everyone was, hey, Blondie, hey, lad. And the community knew them, and we stopped by the house of a guy who they had arrested many times, who had just gotten out of prison after being in there 15 years. And, you know, they were like, he's one of the biggest gangbangers in the city and had like seven murders on him. Mm -hmm. But they were, you know, they wanted to drop in to visit his mom because Tim had still been investigating her first son's, her eldest son's murder for 20 years. His son was killed in like 90. Wow. And he wanted to assure her, I'm still investigating it. I'm never going to just let this go. Mm -hmm. And the conversation that took place was completely in uh, opposition or defiance of what I've been seeing in the press about how cops are serving communities of color. They were very respected. They were very liked. Mm -hmm. And I said, this is the conversation that America needs to see. Yeah, I think we definitely highlight, you know, there there are bad apples in every, everything mm -hmm. in every, you know, form of community and all this other stuff. And we definitely highlight that because that's what we generally want to hear. Right. But I, ref I refuse to believe that... They're all bad apples. They're all bad apples. And these guys, um, you know, this was after the Trayvon Martin, um, Trayvon Martin's... Uh, uh, murder and then uh, George Zimmerman being set free mm -hmm. months after that that's when I meet them and then I learn that they had a relationship with the community and so often I think a lot of these cases happen uh, where you see cops killing unarmed uh, black and brown people they don't know the community that they're serving they don't know the people right Tim and Bobby knew the people hey let me go stop by so-and-so's mom's right. house if they the kids that they'd arrested many times young gangbangers 15 16 years old they call their moms, go pick the mom up, bring the mom to, to jail, mm -hmm. to bail the kid out, then drive the kid and the mom home. Where do cops do that? Right. And if they are doing it, we need to see it. So yeah. that was what said, okay, I have to do this book. If for no other reason than to elevate the conversation, the people know that there are cops out there like you. Right. And for there to be some sort of paradigm shift or a template to say, have these kinds of relationships with your community. Right. I think I honestly... With big groups or organizations, there's some type of code of conduct. Mm -hmm. And I, from what I've heard from a lot of cops, it's like, okay, we don't want to, you know, we don't want to live in the community that we're policing because we're mm -hmm. targets. And it's just kind of like, okay, well, why would you be a target if you're doing what you're supposed to be doing? Exactly. Right? So it's just kind of like, you know, it, 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 there is a code of conduct, and they wouldn't target you in this. And even if you don't live in the community, because Tim and Bobby didn't live in Compton, they lived in Orange County, but they knew the residents of Compton. And so talked if to you're them like new, humans. And they talked to them like they never lost sight of the humanity of the people in the community they were serving, because mm -hmm. they saw themselves as serving that community, not just policing people who are serving a community. And that's what it says on the side of the card, to protect and serve. So, you know, why not do that? A new cop coming into a, a community doesn't have to live there. They can go around knocking on doors. Right. Hi, I'm I'm Bob so and so. Right. I'm 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 a new cop here, but I want to know your name and I want to know your face. And whether they re remember your name or not, at least they've seen your face. So if you're walking in that neighborhood, who they are you? you. They, yeah. they know you. They oh, that's the lady in the third house on such and such street. Right. People don't want to do that anymore. Well, I think we're all in a in a form of a, almost PTSD now. Like we see yes. all the stuff that's on social media, on TV, and even take it away from the political stuff, just the natural disasters that we've, we've been experiencing. Mm -hmm. It's very overwhelming. It's a lot. So it's just kind of like you have two sides. Don't want to listen again. You know, the conversation needs to happen. Right. So many people are, you know, have planted their feet on whatever side they fall on, mm -hmm. and what they shout at each other falls on deaf ears. So. Um, any clues? Mm -hmm. Is that person alive who uh, killed Tupac? Or is Tupac still alive? <laughs> well, for both, I think, you have to watch the docuseries. It's a really good docuseries. I'm going to watch it. We are so wanna... proud of this docuseries. And, and I say that um, in a particularly deep-seated way because it was never my intent to be in front of the camera. Mm -hmm. You know, I came on this as a producer. And next thing you know... Um, my investigative skills, they were like, we want you on the show. Mm -hmm. And um, with all of the deep diving that we did, I really did feel like this was a mission. You know, that it's, you know, I always look at, I'm always challenging what is my purpose in life. Um, and it evolves in multiple purposes. 
And I feel like I had a purpose in this. Like right. I was supposed to be a part of this. And really am very proud of this series. Very proud of being pulled into it. Very proud that I got to produce it. And very proud of the hard, legitimate work that we put in trying to get to answers. Okay, even though you didn't give me any informa information, <laughs> you sold me, and I hope you sold everybody else. So. Um, now, what's after this? Um, a bunch of things. Uh, I'm doing a bunch of things. Like I said, um, uh, Benjamin Crump and I uh, are developing quite a few things. Um, um, a couple of my books are being turned into films, okay. and so there's that that's happening. And uh, um, I actually have a, a TV show that's being developed. So there's a few things. You want to give the name of the TV show? <laughs> It'll be coming soon. But it, it, but it's based on the trilogy of books, the popular trilogy of okay. books that I have. Okay. Um, the scenes from my sister trilogy of books. Yeah, I saw them. I'm that. like, oh, I need to add this to the to the, the long list of <laughs> uh, kind of changing, switching gears. As far as reading is concerned, what are the numbers looking like as far as people buying books, people reading books? Has it gone down? Has it gone up? It's kind of been, you know, reading is, is, is up and down, you know, and for, for various reasons. But one of the reasons that contributes even more so to the ups and downs is that we live in, in an era where people have very short attention spans. They want quick bites, you know. Um, or, or answers. They want short answers. <laughs> and in many instances, they want the answer in the headline. Right. Tell it to me in the headline. You know, um, um, they want the quick hit in and out. And so... A lot of, in a lot of instances, unless they have time on their hands, like they're on the train mm -hmm. or they're in a static moment where they have time to read, they'll read. You see a lot of people reading, you know, listening to audiobooks because that's easier. Right. As opposed to reading. Um, but I, I, I think books are always going to have their value, whether it's in an ebook form or whether it's in a physical copy. You know, people tend to like, the, you know, the ones that read physical copies of books love the feel of a book to hold it in their hand and hear the spine crackle. Right. You know. There are, there's a whole generation that's grown up reading books on their phones or reading it on a laptop. You know, for me, that kind of kills my eyes. Right. But it's the experience that they've been raised with. So I think books are always going to have value. They're going to have their ups and downs. But a good story, a good compelling story, whether mm -hmm. it's fiction or nonfiction, there's always going to be merit in that. And now, because of the book and um, the docuseries, I definitely see a path of helping the community or aiding the community because of the journalism and all the digging that you've done, is there going to be something, like, did you kind of get bit with the bug as more of, like, civil rights type stuff? Is there going to be something in that area that you're going to be doing as well? I've always had that civil rights bent to me. It mm -hmm. kind of looked the part a little bit. That's what you know? I, I didn't want to say it, but, um, you know. <laughs> anybody who knows my email address, my email address is very kind of civil rightsy sounding. Oh boy! Okay. And it's and it, my email address is Soul Sister, and it's that on every platform where I have an email. It's that on AOL. I still I'm one of the lone people that still has AOL. I know. I've had that AOL address for 20 years, 20 plus years. It's that on my own website. It's that on Yahoo. It's that on Gmail. It's it's that. My parents were born in the Jim Crow South in the Mississippi Delta. Um, with the whole, you know, colored section, this, mm -hmm. that, and the other. My parents literally picked cotton. They had to quit school early, you know. Um, they didn't get to finish school because they had to pick cotton for the family. Um, and so when they got married in the early 60s, they left. They didn't want that life for right. the children that they had. And they moved to South Florida. So, And my parents have passed on since. But um, every summer of my life growing up, we went back to that small area where they were from in Mississippi Delta. And my father would lecture me on the way there. When you get there, Lolita, you know, do not um, give any lip back to these white people, you know, especially like my father uh, um, would, you know, we'd see the owners of the land where they used to pick cotton. Mm -hmm. And so the owner might call my father by his first name, but that owner's kid might call my father by his first name. Right. The owner's six-year-old kid called my father by his first name, but my father would call them Mr. Whatever. And he and my father knew I had the spirit. Like, why? Right. And he'd say, just, just <laughs> shut it. Dude, dude, we're out of here. You know, we'd see clan marches on the way there. You know, me growing up in Fort Lauderdale, there's an area in Broward County, Davie. Mm -hmm. Every year there'd be clan marches. That was a center for the clan. Not so, anymore. 
well, it was there for a long time, so I haven't checked, but they were there in modern, day, like in the 80s and 90s. Yeah. They would have their annual Klan marches. So Davie, Florida had a center for the Klan. Yeah. Uh, and they, you know, the, 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 the Constitution protected their right to march. I know there's points, because um, I'm actually from Toronto, but we used to drive down, mm -hmm. and the rumor was always, don't drive through Florida. Like, certain parts of Florida you don't want to be in at night. Mm -hmm. And it didn't, you know dawn until I hear all these stories, you know, clan and et cetera about people, Florida. People, you know, I think get kind of confused about Florida because of South Beach and Miami. Mm -hmm. and it's all very international. It's kind of like the, you know, um, um, the French Riviera of the states, right. basically. Anything, you know, you're cool. If you're Palm Beach, Broward, Dade County, anything from there on down, you're kind of okay. Actually, up until you, like, you get to Homestead and places like that, and those are very much the South. Anything above Palm Beach County, you're in the deep south. You know, there's a term, Florida cracker, from the whip crackers, you know, cracking their whips on the slaves. It's the deep south, you know. And I, I lived in Winter Park in the Orlando area briefly uh, in the late 80s. And I always thought, you know, Orlando was a progressive right. town and that whole area. But I'm like, this is the country with a city dress on. If you look under the dress, it's the deep south. So Florida very much, you could see any, in Florida in recent years, especially, you know, I think when uh, Trayvon Martin was killed and, and all that happened in Sanford, it shone the light on Sanford and mm -hmm. the values and very much kind of that whole Southern good old boy kind of thing right. was there. Well, that, that story I know. still baffles me. Um, we've been talking for a while. And you still haven't given me any answers. <laughs> but just in case people are joining at the very end, which I don't know why you would be, what are the reasons that people should, one, definitely read the book if they haven't, you should, and two, why they should watch the DACA series and when it's coming out? Well, okay. That's three. Okay. Uh, they should read the book because it's the history of Compton, told, I believe, I feel, and what we've been getting feedback on in a very engaging way. Um, you learn about the city, its dynamics. You learn about the gangs. You learn about um, the community. You learn uh, there's very much a strong hip-hop element to it. You learn about how hip-hop culture came about in that area. The, you know, NWA, the DJ Quick, all of those um, entertainers that came from that area. But you're seeing it all through the eyes of these two cops. And mm -hmm. what's really interesting is another reason that it's, it's crazy that I even got involved with this book because I'm so Afrocentric. And here it is, is. These two white cops were appointed to, you know, run the gang unit. Mm -hmm. And Compton's is 10.2 square miles, and they have 55 gangs, black and brown gangs. And so it's two white cops who right. are charged with taming the savages. You would think, oh, yeah. no, I can't stand white saver stories. No, these were two guys who were very good at what they did. The community respected them. So I think people should read the book because they're taken on a journey that I think is very unexpected through mm -hmm. the eyes of these guys seeing that world. And in the process, they learn about the Tupac murder case. They get answers from this book about the Tupac murder case. You get answers. Uh, the Biggie murder case. Um, and the fall of the Compton Police Department, which is one of the craziest things ever. They should watch the series because we do a really deep dive into the Tupac murder investigation. We turn over stones that a lot of people didn't turn over. We talk to a lot of people that a lot of people have never even heard of who had very close relationships with Tupac. Um, you learn a lot about Tupac along the way mm -hmm. with us investigating him. Things, you know, from his childhood to his teen years to his adulthood, you know, every phase of his life. We explore looking for answers and learning about him along the way. And the show, um, the, the show premieres on November 21st, the Tuesday oh, during the so week of Thanksgiving. Away. It's actually not, though. The promos are about to start running next week. So it's not that far away. It's coming up very quickly. Look at how September was a blink. Oh uh, yeah, it is the tail end, but just it feels so far away because now I really want to know the answers, and you haven't. Been. <laughs> be patient. It's going to be so worth it. It's really, you know, I know I'm a part of it. I know I'm a producer on it. I know I'm on camera, but I'm so proud of this series. I mean, we really put our heart and souls into it, and we care. We legitimately care about getting answers. So the answer that you end up getting, that you're not <laughs> going to tell me, um, will that person be arrested at the end of the docuseries? You have to watch the docuseries. I have to 
give one last try. Uh, where can people find you on social media? I'm so easy to find. You can find me by my name, Lolita Files, which is my actual name. People think I made it up. It's not. It's my actual name. So you can find me at Twitter, LolitaFiles.com, Instagram, LolitaFiles.com, Facebook, LolitaFiles.com, my website, LolitaFiles.com. So simple. <laughs> well, I really, really appreciate you mm -hmm. for coming in, talking to me. Even though I tried, I think I tried like 10 times, y'all. <laughs> and I put .com on some places where it shouldn't be. Lolita Files on Twitter, Lolita Files on Instagram, Lolita Files on Just Facebook. Just put it in Google, you'll and everything I'll will pop, pop up. up. So, really, really appreciate it. Thank you for I am me. looking forward to this docuseries. I think you should do like a live tweet or something. Oh, I absolutely will be live tweeting. Okay. I'll be in Atlanta um, the week that it premieres, but I will be live tweeting okay. something fierce. So, we'll, I'll be following all that. Uh, thank you guys for joining me on Black Hollywood Live Conversations. My name is TK Trinidad. You can find me on everything at TK Trinidad. As well, I did mention there's a whole bunch of stuff that's happening. Um, natural disasters, all that good stuff. I do post a lot of stuff where you can donate money, um, food, clothing, all that stuff to people that have, you know, been affected by natural disasters and the de disaster that also happened in Las Vegas as well. So if you want to follow me at TK Trinidad, I have a lot of stuff that, even, even though you feel hopeless, people helping people. So let's kind of get that all together. Really appreciate you guys for joining in, and uh, we'll catch you when you catch you. See ya. From executives Kevin Undergaro, Dario Kristen, Tiana Hobson, and the entire BHL staff, we would like to thank you for supporting Black Hollywood Live, the first online broadcast network dedicated to African American entertainment. For questions and comments, contact us, info at blackhollywoodlive.com. Like us on Facebook, tweet us, or Instagram us at BHL Online. And I am the official voice of Black Hollywood Live, Scipio, Instagramming, at KingXOBay. Thanks for tuning in. The views expressed here are those of the host owner and do not necessarily reflect the views of BHL or its owners or principals.